Schultz, the cartoonist, uh, teaches the power of organization, the power of unity. And, you know, we know that that's a formidable power, where the people are united for good or united for evil. When they get together, it's a strong power. Um, but that's not exactly all that God is saying here. What God is teaching us through Paul as he struggles with this new church in Corinth to uh, get them to submit to Jesus Christ and to surrender to Jesus Christ um, is to surrender. He's trying to teach them how to surrender their self-interests um, at the lordship of Jesus Christ because unity and, and power uh, in the church only comes when we are surrendered to Christ. We can be united with each other, but unless we're united with Christ, we don't really have the power. Now, we're not going to read this entire chapter. Uh, the, Paul begins teaching them about spiritual gifts. He says about spiritual things. And we have seen in the previous chapters um, that there have been some divisions and some factions. It seems like every chapter we learn about some new kind of problem that they have in Corinth. And last week, the, the faction, remember, was over the way that they were taking communion and that they were, you know, in the midst of kind of this party. And not only was it a party, but some of the people were eating all the food and really disrespecting some of the poor members. And in the context of that, they were trying to have communion, the, the Lord's Supper. And it was to be a time when they were to kind of demonstrate their unity. Instead, it had become this demonstration of the factions and the arrogance that some of them had. But in this chapter, the division isn't about food, it isn't about bad manners, it's about spiritual gifts. And Paul lists nine spiritual gifts in verses 8 to 10. Uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, performance of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues. I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, except to say that th these gifts are not talents. These are not skills. These are supernatural gifts given to God as God chooses in the particular church to meet the situation that's there. And it's, I mean, it's quite possible that, that you may have never really been around one of these gifts of the Spirit. Um, they are extraordinary, and they really have nothing to do with the individual. And, you know, some people will teach that these, um, these gifts all stopped in the first century. And if you've been taught that, and you've been going to church your entire life, that these gifts are no more, then you probably will never see one of these gifts. Because you're not going to recognize it even if it's right in front of you. And you're not going to be in a situation where these gifts might get used. And my, my, my personal... Um, take on this is that these gifts are probably much more apparent on the mission field where God needs to do extraordinary things, you know, and like we were talking about last week, our, our problem is, are we even paying attention in America because we have so many distractions, but they, they are there and God moves in supernatural ways sometimes. And, and then there are other people who think that these gifts is all these gifts are all that there is. I mean, you come to church and unless these gifts are present, you haven't really been to church. So you just kind of have church until, you know, there's a tongue and interpretation and a prophecy and a word of wisdom and healing and you know, they just focus on the gifts so much and not so much on the giver. Now, I not and I kind of came into the, this is going to shock some of you. Uh not and I kind of came into the church our church wasn't like that, but when when we came to the Lord when we were 26, there was a lot of this stuff going around, and there was a whole move of the Holy Spirit that was going on in the 70s. And, you know, I was like most people, I didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit, and then I experienced the Holy Spirit, and I've been trying to figure that out, you know, all those years. But I remember one incident in particular, and this is embarrassing, so I, I figure that if I tell you something kind of shameful about myself, you'll tell me things about you and we'll be fine, right? <laughs> but but the, the, the whole experience was that uh, there were a bunch of young couples and we had all become Christians. I mean, we were just babies. And uh, we had, were at a prayer meeting and a man was there that was teaching us about these gifts of the Spirit. 
And one of the ladies at the prayer meeting who uh, was a neighbor of ours, uh, she spoke in tongues. And she did it all the time. She didn't even know what it was. She didn't even know, before, yeah, I know, before she started speaking in tongues, she didn't even know there was such a thing as speaking in tongues. And so we are like, wow, man, that's weird. That's pretty neat, though, you know. Could you say some more? And, <laughs> and we would have a prayer time, and in the midst of the prayer time, she would do that, and we would all go, wow, you know. And on the way home, from the prayer time, I, I remember, remember talking and I going, I'm trying to figure out which one of those nine I, I want, you know, because like she's, she's got a really good one, but I probably don't want that one because she's already got that, you know, and it's kind of like there were gifts underneath the Christmas tree that I was trying to decide which one I really wanted, you know, and there are only nine to pass out. And so I needed to get one for somebody. You know, I thought, you know, if I got healing, then I could heal people. That would be really good, or, you know, but maybe I should be just wise. I, I, does that fit? So, but anyway, that, that was where, we, and so it was kind of like Corinth, I think, the way we started off. And we had a really good pastor, and he kind of untaught us on all that crazy stuff, you know. And he didn't diminish the gifts of the Spirit, but then he told us the proper use that God distributes them, distributes them in the church the way that God decides to do it. We don't get to pick one. You know, that this isn't some kind of a, a prize that God gets, gives us for attending church. So, um, you know, Paul, uh, at the church in Corinth, the, the gifts of the Spirit are very evident. Earlier on here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching weren't presented with convincing words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. So Paul doesn't come to them lecturing them. He comes, the Spirit is very evident in this church, and this kind of thing is going on. But when he lists the gifts of the Spirit, he brackets them with two verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and 11. And I wanted us to see these because I think this really puts in perspective what's going on, what, what he intends here. Verse 7 says, A demonstration of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. Okay, not for our good but for the common good. And then verse 11, he says, All these things are produced by the one and same Spirit who gives what he wants to each person. So each person gets a demonstration of the power of the Spirit, if you want it, you know, and God distributes them not for the person, but for the community, God, for the church. So it's not about us, and it's not about us showing how pious I am or how much faith I have because, you know, I'll use this gift in the body of Christ. It's not about that at all. It's all about the church. It's about the body. Now, what uh, Paul does next is that he drives home this point that the church is Christ's body here on earth and that the body is very diverse but united. And he uses the metaphor of the human body to explain uh, the interdependence and the importance of each person in the church. So here we go to the meat of where we're going today. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. He says, Christ is just like the human body. A body as a unit has many parts, and all the, the parts of the body are one body, even though they are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek or slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not a part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like he wanted if all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? So there he says it again, see? He says, the body of the church is made up of different people and through whom God works a variety of gifts. And it's a pretty simple point, I think, to understand, but it's, it's really not that easy to live. Um, verse 19, I think, gives the problem last verse. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But, you know... That, that's not really what we expect. We, we go to church and we really expect everybody to kind of look alike and talk alike and dress alike and act alike. And, you know, that's, it's conformity. And 
we seek, most of us, a certain amount of conformity. Maybe we want to set ourselves apart just a little bit, be a little bit different, but most of us like to be around people that are, are like us and talk like us and aren't a lot different. It's kind of like, you know, wearing a, a uniform and I'm just like everyone else. I'm part of the group because we all act the same and talk the same and, and like the same things. And, you know, I actually had a young lady that came to me and she hadn't been a Christian very long. And she said, she came to me and she said, uh, do we like or dislike rap music? (laughs) So she asked, do we like or dislike? And it took me a while to figure out what she just wanted to know what the company policy was. You know, I I don't remember what I said to her, but I'm sure it was very wise. Right. (laughs) But. Do we like or dislike rap music? And again, is there a conformity here? I don't know. We'll vote on it in the church, see if we like it or not. But, you know, there's a, there's a weakness in conformity. Paul says in the church that we are different and we, we are who we are because God made us. God has placed us here. And he says that's good because if we were all the same body part, wouldn't that be kind of a funny looking body, you know, like one big ear, you know, you got, how's you going to roll down the road, kind of one big ear, just a big nose, you know, how does that, what was a, what good's a big nose to us? And he says, no, if you're a big toe, be a big toe. God placed you there as a big toe. God wants you to be a big toe. If you're the pinky, okay, be the pinky. God placed you there like that. And he's speaking here to those in the church who think, that the gift that they have, the, their place in the church, is that they're really not important. And, you know, I go there, but, you know, I'm not important. I'm not anybody in that church. And Paul says, hey, you may be a foot, but you're just as important as the head, okay? Because God has made you a foot, and God has placed you in a body where you are. And, of course, he's speaking to spiritual gifts, but I think it goes to everything. The conflict that they were having was in the spiritual gifts, but it applies everywhere. We are who we are because God has made us this way, and God has put us in this place where we are because we make up his body. And like it or not, those of us that think we have lesser gifts, if we're not there, the body is not whole. Maybe that we may be in the body of Christ and we don't feel like we belong. You know, we, we consider ourselves to be inferior. We consider ourselves to be less gifted. Now, now think about that just for a minute. If that's you, if you, you know, if this is hitting you and you think, well, yeah, I go to church, but I'm not really a very important person there. And there are others that have great leadership and, you know, they can sing or they can speak or they can lead. And, and you know, I'm not really very important there. What you're saying is that God has mismade you, that God has misplaced you, you see, is what you're really insulting God. Because there's no insignificant gift. When we let God use us, no matter how small the gift is, when we let God do it to the glory of God, because He is the giver and we are each a part of the body and there is no gift that's too insignificant or small because God is the giver of the gift, and God has placed us here. See, we, most of us think that the, the important church and the people are the ones with the visible gifts, okay? The preachers, the teachers, the musicians, the leaders. God says, no, nah, that's not it at all, you know? What if you had a whole church full of preachers? I can tell you what that would be like. There would be so much complaining and so much bragging, okay? That's what a church would be like with a whole bunch of preachers. Just a lot of complaining and a lot of bragging. What, what if the church was just full of all musicians? Everybody had that gift and everybody was a musician. How would we have enough microphones or how could we keep turning up everybody's mic at the same time? Right? We all want, I'm looking at the musicians and they're going, that's not me. I know it's not you. That's why it's funny. Okay. <laughs> But everybody wants, everybody wants their mic turned up at once. What if we, all we had was visionary leaders? Who's, who's going to follow? If there's no visionary, nobody to follow. If everybody's just a visionary leader, everybody's got, you know, a different idea of what's supposed to happen. You know, we, in the city, we think, well, the most important person in the city of Lexington is the mayor, right? Most important person. Mayor can go on vacation for a month, the city will function. 
Garbage collectors go on vacation for one week, go on strike, city breaks down, right? It gets stinky real quick without, without them. So never think that who I am is not important. Through the years, I've noticed that there are some people who think that that they are just not important, and oftentimes they go unnoticed, and usually those are the ones who are indispensable. You know, in, in San Diego every year in one neighborhood, they have a parade that nobody goes to because everybody's in the parade. Nobody gets to watch this parade. Everybody's in the parade. It started with a guy named Bob Goff. He and his kids were at home one time on New Year's Day, and his daughter said, New Year's is boring. And he agreed. He said, so what are we going to do about it? So they started brainstorming, and they, you know, they wanted to do things like, uh, well, what we need is a pony or we need a rocket ship. And so you know, he kind of steered them a little bit different direction. And he and his wife, Marie, and the kids sat around the dining room table, and they dreamed up what a parade might look like. And they could wear costumes, and they could hold balloons, and maybe they could invite the neighbors to watch. Well, what the whole thing turned into was it finally kind of morphed into that, that first year that they went and asked the neighbors to be in the parade, but nobody could watch. Nobody could sit on the front porch. Anybody that was out watching got pulled into the parade. And now they have an annual parade in their neighborhood, and they go back to the golfs, and they have, you know, uh, hamburgers and, and grill out and stuff. But but what it's turned into is this annual parade, and they have like a uh, master ceremony. So the last year, the master ceremony was his local mailman, and he had all this fake mail that he went through in the front, throwing out letters. We hope it was fake stuff. And and they, they have a queen, and uh, they go to the local retirement home and and get a lady to be the queen. But the whole idea is that everybody is in the parade, isn't that a neat idea? It's kind of scary. What if your neighbors said, we're having a parade, and you'd, you'd say, you know, not, don't go to the door again don't, if he's there. Don't answer the door. You know, he's just a weirdo. But I just thought, you know, it talks about the church, you know. It's exactly what God envisions for the church. Instead of just, you know, maybe we sit around and we might even go home and complain. And, you know, everybody gets in the parade. Everybody, everybody does it. No one's left out. No one gets just to watch and say, you know, I, that was okay, but I, you know, I've seen better. No, you have to get up and get in the parade. Well, let's go on. Uh, verse 20. It says, but as it is, there are many parts but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The most private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this, but God has put the body together. There we are again. Giving greater honor to the part with less honor so that there won't be division in the body and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. And then I love this, this last verse, verse 26. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. Again, God has put them together. God it says God puts us together so that we might have mutual concern. And, you know, if one part suffers, everybody suffers. If one part is celebrating, everybody is celebrating. And, and this isn't, this doesn't have that should celebrate or sh should suffer or ought to. See, this isn't a commandment. This is how he sees things really are in the body, that you really have a body of Christ. If you really have a community of people who are in one, in Christ, this is what happens. Is that when somebody hurts, everybody hurts with that person. They, they don't have to think I should do it or I ought to do it. It just naturally happens. And we might have difficulty kind of, you know, realizing this in our church community. Someone might be hurting and we might not even know it, or someone might have just gotten a great job this week and, and we might not know that either. And, you know, we see here in the text that what Paul envisions as being the reality of the church is much greater than our experience. He sees a church that's so tight, that's got so much community, they share the same pain receptors, Okay, and the same triggers for joy and laughter. And they are connected somehow into the same bloodstream. 
and you know whose bloodstream that is. They're most, this is really, I kind of, you know, I look at this and I think, hey, that's what most of us think is being the perfect family, right? This is, this is our vision of what a family ought to be like, where everybody's got your back. No matter what you do, they let you in, right? Nothing you can do where they keep you away from, from getting in the house. And when you, you're hurting, everybody knows you're hurting. And, and when you're happy, everybody's happy right along with you. You know, nobody in the family goes, well, I know he got that job, but I wish I had that job, right? No, families don't. That's the perfect family. And, you know, I think we, we would say, hey, I, I want to be in that. I want to be in a family like that. I want a church where I know that God has placed me there, where the gifts God gives me will be used, and where I know that I'm part of something big. We say, man, that sounds nice. Everyone is important. Everyone is needed. So here's your question. Is that your experience? You know, we, we can go to church our entire lives, and I've known many people. I've, I've performed funerals for many people like this. Go to church their entire life and never feel like they really belong. They go to church. They give their money. They participate. All right? Their names are on the rolls. And yet they never feel like the church needs them or like their gifts are being used. It's so sad. Good people, really good-hearted people. And they go their whole lives and they never, never feel like they belong. I've got a friend over in Louisville that started a church a couple years ago. And the motto is a church where anyone can belong. And that sounds really good. I know what he's getting at. And no matter what you've done in life, no matter, no matter what your experience is, they will say no to anybody. Anybody, you know, they will not say no. That's a double negative. They will let anyone in, okay? okay edit that out. They will say yes to anybody. And, and you know, anybody can belong, but it's, it's a little bit misleading because there'll be people who say, yeah, I want to be in, and they'll go, and they'll never feel like they belong, because just simply having the door open isn't enough. There has to be a, a mutual connection there. Going is not belonging. Belonging means that I'm in the parade. and <laughs> There's no one to watch because we're all in the parade together. A job fair at a high school, um, they, they invited the local Army and the Navy and the Marine recruiter to come in and and they each had 15 minutes, and the Army guy got up and gave his spiel, and he ran about 20 minutes, and the Navy guy got up, and he ran even longer, got to the Marine guy, and the time was out. And so the Marine guy looks over the auditorium of the high school students and says, I doubt if there's two or three of you who could be Marines. But if anybody's interested, meet me over here. Once they stopped, he, he had a huge line. Army and the Navy, not so much. I said, anybody could be in the Army and the Navy. I hope we don't have any Army and Navy guys here, because that really isn't true. Those guys are lying. Not anybody can be. But, but the Marine guy, we're just looking for a few good men. Maybe, maybe one or two of you might be in the Marines. But you see what he was appealing to was, was the idea that God has a place for me, and I'm gifted in this, and can I rise to this? Can I use this? Can I make a difference with my life? And I think God has so much more in mind for the body of Christ than just a church where anybody can get in. I really do. Well, when God envisions the church, what he envisions is a body that's so tight that when somebody's unhappy, everybody feels it just naturally. And when everybody's celebrating, everybody else just celebrates with them just naturally because we're in Christ, we're in the same blood bloodstream. We've been baptized in the same spirit, drink of the same spirit, and no one is better, no one is worse here. God has some really high expectations for the church. Okay? I, I just don't think it's anybody can get in. And that, my friends, is dependent upon each person. You know, are we willing to belong? Are we willing to raise our expectations so that the parade doesn't start without us. You know, it's just dependent on each person. If each person gets it, then they belong. I hope you get that today. Let's just sit in prayer with that for a minute.
As deep cries out. 